the medical nature, oftentimes you may contact the IFF and the residents will respond, and I will um, assist them in that effort, and we enjoy doing that very much. Today I'm delighted to be able to moderate the infectious disease session for you. We have three fantastic speakers. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Kelly, Dr. Roberts, and Dr. Ted Peckinpah, and I'm going to actually have them speak in alphabetical order as they are on the agenda. Um, and so first, we're going to have Dr. Kelly, who um, is um, the Chief Medical Officer for the City, um, Fire Department of New York. She received her Doctor of Medicine from Brown University in 1977. when we become a firefighter that we know we have to expect to see. But we don't always think about uh, the exposures of an infectious nature that can also um, be of concern and have a lasting impact on our lives. So it's important that we think about that in every task that we take on. And the, the goal is always to reduce risk. Um, I'm just sort of giving you some thoughts, which is that we want to promote safe practices through education and training. We want to prevent illness wherever possible. We're going to be protecting our members with the appropriate PPE. Um, we want to make sure that after an exposure, we're offering prophylaxis at the appropriate time as quickly as possible. And that we have to really keep an open mind in problem solving and trying to um, promptly diagnose and treat people. So how do we do that? Well, we, again, we have to look at each of the tasks and roles that people take on and see where can we reduce risk wherever possible. In the fire department, we have a few things in place. We have a, a, a day called Education Day where um, active members on duty are brought to 
The Rock, which is our training academy. They're brought up to date on new equipment. They're, they're taught hands-on how to respond to new situations that may have arisen or new equipment that's come into place. And we also do mass fit testing out there and do any educational pieces to bring them up to date. At the same time, when people come for their annuals, we incorporate uh, necessary training so that we do bloodborne pathogen training at that day. We do redoing mass fit testing as well as um, all of the different masks that people will require on the job. Uh, we do firehouse visits, uh, particularly after someone has had a case of MRSA. There's often a concern in the rest of the firehouse about what's going to happen. We will go directly to the firehouse to talk about it. Uh, we work with um, the field, the safety, and Bureau of Health Services. We send out messages through multiple ways because communication to the members is critical so that they know what's going on. This is an example of one of our newsletters called Health Connections. Uh, we miss recovering MRSA, but we'll cover different topics that we think are relevant or questions that are coming in so that people have an idea of what's going on. Uh, one of the most, the, the cornerstones of safety, of course, is immunization. So when you come on the job, we do baseline blood work on you. If your titers indicate that you are in need of vaccination, we will give you vaccination when you become a member of the department. Measles, mumps, and rubella are given. We check for rubella titers. Um, in hepatitis B, um, recently, more of our, our younger members have already been immunized against it because of the childhood immunization program for hep B, but we still check everyone's immunity when they come on. Um, what we'll do is when they start training, we'll make sure their three shots are given, the first two in training and the third at their um, first annual exam so that people are assured of being immunized. Again, there's been a huge improvement in that immunization program with a marked redu reduction nationwide thanks to that immunization program. So the Hep B vaccine is a safe vaccine. Um, it's a synthetic vaccine. You know, originally there were some concerns about that it was coming from uh, humans or other, um, the safety issue, but it has a great track record and it's the best way to protect yourself. So getting that shot for people is critical. We offer Hep A uh, for our scuba and water rescue companies. Um, one of the new uh, changes is the tetanus recommendations. There's a new vaccine, Tdap, which also offers additional protection against pertussis. A lot more expensive, but worthwhile. A lot of the winter cough symptoms may be due to pertussis, and in the firehouse <laughs> environment where everyone is living like a family close together, if you can cut down on pertussis, that's a huge uh, improvement. So one vaccine with this um, is, is very reasonable to do. Of course, TB testing is important. That's, again, done at annuals yearly so that we can follow people's TB status to be sure they're negative. Um, flu vaccine is offered annually. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that and how we now offer that in a different um, approach with our Biopod program. And pneumonia vaccine is offered for those people that have some underlying medical problems. Usually by age, we don't have an older workforce, but we do have people now with some respiratory problems, some underlying medical problems, diabetes or other, that it's recommended. So that's also offered. Again, we use the annual medical for an opportunity to discuss what they're due for and give people their vaccination. Your best protection, of course, is your PPE. Oh, sorry. So vaccination, Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have the declination and uh, acceptance. Mm -hmm. We've been, we, oh sure. He asked about do people have the opportunity to decline their vaccines, and they do. Um, we don't, they're not mandatory. Um, um, I, I can't say we've seen a great um, change. I mean, the biggest change is this reduction nationwide in some of these problems. But I can say it always translates into a decreased medical leave. It, uh, it, it's really, it's a lot of work to get people sometimes to be vaccinated. I'll talk a little bit when I, when I talk about our programs we put into place after 9-11 with the bioterrorism program and, and how we work with the unions to really um, talk up the, the value of the vaccines. This is particularly relevant with H1N1, so I'll get to that on the slide. 
um, again, we, you want to have the appropriate PPE in place. Um, I, I think one message that's important is you can't go back after the event and say, you can say, I should have used PPE, but it's better to have it in place before you walk into the event. And in many cases, you do not know what you are going to find. You may go in on, a, on a run thinking it's one thing, and you find out the situation is different. Um, we've had you know, many instances where people have had blood in the eye, blood in the mouth, other areas, because they didn't have some of the gear in place. And again, now you're living with the problems and the worry about it, and you're trying to protect people before the event. So again, we're remembering that there's always unknowns, there's always uncontrolled situations. And the other aspect is minimizing the exposures of the team. Um, many times when the entire company responds to some of the EMS calls, um, you need to say, do we need five or six people in the room? Maybe we only need the officer and one person instead of exposing every single person. Again, this became an issue in the, in the H1N1 season, SARS type situations where you want to think about, do we need every single person there? Oops, sorry. Okay. One of the key um, aspects of our job is making sure that people are protected after an exposure. We have an exposure mechanism that's electronic. Um, we also have the on-call physicians to respond and uh, talk to the member and see what's going on. Um, that is important because the member then speaks to the medical officer. That pr uh, triggers the infection control officer to put in a request for information and our nursing staff to be involved in drawing of blood, um, making sure medications are offered and getting everything going. The ideal is to offer medications as quickly as possible if someone has had a true exposure. Uh, the Ryan White Act, which I know is going to be covered here, is helpful in obtaining some of the information about um, victims or civilians that you've been exposed to, but it has limitations. There are, there's always a delay in information, and we aren't always assured of getting all the information we want. So the message has to be, if you have had a true exposure, you should begin medication. Do not wait for the results of tests, because the tests may take longer to come back, and we're never always guaranteed the results. This is an example of our biological exposure report system. Again, this is not just on paper, it's now done electronically so that we can send the information and, and collect the uh, data. Um, main concerns are if you've had a blood to blood or an open wound, and then uh, again, we would offer medications to protect against uh, HIV. You need to talk to the member about what the exposure was, assessing risk. This is an area where there's not a complete 100% yes and 0% risk. It's usually somewhere in the middle, and you're discussing what's going on. You want to review the immunization profile, again, at that time. Maybe they need a tetanus shot. Maybe they need to be uh, reviewed about their hep B. Many people who are declining shots sometimes accept shots after an exposure. Uh, we do baseline blood work, including hep C and HIV. Again, hep C, there's no prophylaxis against. <laughs> HIV, there are acceptable prophylaxis, usually given for 28 days. And we do follow-up blood work afterwards, usually at several weeks, three months, six months, up to a year, to be sure that people remain negative. This is all done you know, in a private way so that the information is not uh, given out. Uh, we need to start prophylaxis right away and also the inquiries that are going in regarding the source individual may take longer to get back. From, we, we're dependent on morgue if someone has died. If it's an ME case, we're looking for the hospital to get information, and it is not perfect. One of the big exposures we run into are the meningitis exposures, and those are often done <coughs> after the fact. So people go on a run, whether it's EMS or fire, and they just see a sick patient. And then two days later, we get a phone call from Department of Health or from the hospital ER saying, by the way, that person has meningococcal meningitis. So now we're trying to catch up and give people prophylaxis. So finding the individuals, offering medication becomes a bigger deal because it's usually being done after the fact. And again, that often creates a great deal of worry. One of the concerns most firefighters have is, are they going to bring something home to their families? That's what we hear over and over again. So part of the education is to say, 
we're treating you, we don't think you're at high risk, but you are not at risk to bring it home to your families. And that's the, the message that we have to constantly give to people. Uh, for respiratory exposures, we do our TB testing on a regular basis, and we, if someone converts, there will be a treatment given. I think one of the, the uh, concepts of infectious disease is there are always new things coming down the line. So MRSA represents one of the new challenges that we've had to face. In the past, that was seen as a hospital-acquired infection and now has become clearly a community-based infection so that we are seeing cases of that in our companies on a regular basis. Um, it's, you know, it's so easy to get these infections because the, the, the germs are everywhere and there are so many cuts and open wounds that people have in everyday life. We see a, certainly a greater um, spike in the summertime when people have more open, exposed skin. You know, you're, you're active and doing things, and it's so easy to get little cuts. Um, so again, education becomes a critical uh, point. You want to clean and cover wounds. Um, you're looking to change, and essentially, the culture of a firehouse. You know, we're, we're accustomed to the idea of we sort of share things, and it, everyone is, you know, uh, I need a towel, I need this, how can I do this? We've had to change our habits because of Hep B and Hep C, where we don't, sh we don't share um, shavers or other, you know, kinds of utensils. Now we have to do it for MRSA, too. So everyone should have their own towel. It should be kept separate. Everyone should have their own liquid soap. They should not be sharing that kind of stuff. Um, washing hands, making sure that on the apparatus floor you have your ability to start washing your hands with a liquid soap the minute you walk in. Those things are important. Wiping down gym equipment when you're using the gym, making sure that it's cleaned uh, appropriately. Uh, even furniture seats, you may want to rethink the couches and things that you buy so that they are easily cleaned and can be um, kept uh, clean all the time. Using, uh, changing the sheets that when you, uh, after you're finished your tour, they, those sheets are taken up, they're washed in fairly hot water so that you can be sure that um, you're not, again, passing things along. If you've got an open wound that has drainage, you shouldn't be in the firehouse. You should be offline away from work. So prompt drainage of, a, of an, an infection, culturing the wound so we know what we're dealing with. Um, there are antibiotics that it does respond to. You just have to choose the antibiotics that it's sensitive to. Most of MRSA is sensitive to both sulfur or tetracycline, so we have other choices to give. Keeping the wounds clean uh, and making sure that you, um, we, d we do a deconning of bunker gear. I, I don't know that it makes a difference, but this way at least we've cleaned their gear. Uh, we do not allow people to go back to duty until the wound is healed. We do do nasal cultures to be sure people are not harboring MRSA at the time with a recognition that you may be harboring MRSA at a later time. But at the time they, clear, they go back, they're cleared of MRSA at that time. The H1N1 uh, flu, again, was a new challenge. It's not that we haven't dealt with flu before, but the concern was that this was affecting younger people and particularly people that might have some uh, respiratory problems. We worked uh, following guidelines of the CDC, state and city Department of Health. Um, there was certainly a greater interest in our members in, in getting vaccination. So uh, again, we changed our responses out in the field when people went to respond to an EMS run. We tried to limit the number of people. People were geared up before they walked in the room, and we made sure that um, people had that extra protection going in. We reinforced how people should be wearing their PPE and the mask use so that people were a lot more, uh, they had, there was a heightened awareness of how to respond. Um, Again, this was a program we worked with union and management. We went to all the union meetings to discuss the changes and to also reinforce the vaccine policy and how important it was to be vaccinated. The bioterrorism threat is a very real one. Um, and just as I said with some of the other things, they can sneak up on you. They're not something that someone always announces, by the way, I'm going to be dropping anthrax. You're looking at something sometimes after the event. We had anthrax here in this city in 2001, which raised uh, concerns as our members uh, had to respond to certain, um, certain areas where they had gotten calls for various uh, problems. 
We dealt with smallpox vaccination. That was a very small program that really uh, did not take off too well um, because there were a lot of concerns and, and um, I think limitations through the federal government as to who would get the vaccine and the safety of the vaccine was raised as an issue. So we, we did a vaccination program, but it was really very small. Um, our biopod is an outgrowth of that um, bioterrorism concern that began after 9-11. What we do is we do an annual drill every year in which all of our on-duty members are brought in to several pods. The pods are points of distribution. They're set up on either EMS stations or firehouses or in some of our uh, training buildings. And all of the members who are on duty come with their company and go through a staged exercise. It, it serves several purposes. It helps us coordinate all the activities. Each of the, the parts of our department work together. It helps remind our members that we are um, practicing and trying to keep up the skills of being able to take care of our workforce in a rapid fashion, should we need to. And I think also, in our case, we've used it to uh, give out the flu vaccine. So it's a good reminder that they're going to get the flu vaccine at that time. The acceptance of the flu vaccine has been much greater at the pods than it is in our annual area where we offer it in a more, I guess, passive way. This is a more active way of offering it, and it's been very successful. So it helps us prepare for the possibility and, and develop tools that we need. So preparedness has to be event specific. Um, for example, when we did deployment of our members to Katrina, we wanted to be sure that everyone's vaccines were up to date, that they were vaccinated against uh, Hep A and all of the other uh, tetanus, et cetera, they were up to date. We have found it very helpful having an electronic medical record with an electronic immunization record so that we can really follow what's going on and we, we're not dependent on, well, did they get the shot or not? Uh, we need to be uh, organism specific when there's the a response, uh, knowing what we're dealing with. We partner with professionals like the CDC and Department of Health. Um, these drills are important because the message to the members is that we are aware of the risks and that we're taking care of people. And it's important for our staff to remind themselves of how to interact and how to carry out activities. Um, so again, as I said, the electronic medical record is critical. Uh, keeping titers uh, up to date, making sure that people's training is up to date. So I just, you know, in, in, in all of the activities you do, there are opportunities to have an exposure of an infectious disease and you never know what you're always going to find. So making sure that everything is in place. You know, when you, when you go to this type of an event, you may be the first on the scene and there may be people injured that you need to take care of. When we had our ferry disaster, again, many people uh, very badly hurt, triaging and, and you know, blood exposures were there. Uh, a gas, a building collapse in our, in our city, finding victims, taking care of victims. You know, in, in, in the average city activity, extreme weathers, I mean, I, I think we have less extreme weathers in many parts of the country, but you're often the first call there, and you need to be sure you're protecting yourselves when you go in to help others. We had the plane crash in the Hudson. This was a uh, collapse of a, uh, um, a main pipe, and uh, several of the people were burned, and they had to remove the victims. Water rescues we have all the time because we're, we're islands surrounded by water. Uh, construction accidents happen all too often. Uh, we had the potential bomb threat in uh, Midtown Manhattan, Times Square. And removing uh, injured members from vehicle crashes are really so common and it's such an opportunity to get hurt with broken glass and people bleeding. Train derailments, again, the kind of activities where you, you're responding and you have to protect yourself. Um, we deliver babies, and when you deliver babies, there's always exposures. Um, one of the, the changes that was made over time is the uh, delivery kits that EMS used always had a scalpel in it. We had scalpel injuries almost every time there was a delivery. The scalpel was removed, it was changed by safe, with, to safety scissors, and it cut back the numbers of um, 
wounds and lacerations incredibly. So sometimes looking at your injuries and seeing where the problem is, you can make a single change that makes a difference in people's um, injuries. So this is the uh, training academy's uh, mantra. And again, as we approach the 10th anniversary, we can't forget the people we lost and we have to make our job as safe as we can possibly make it. Thank you. All right, thank you for an outstanding talk. We have some time for questions. There's a, should, do we want folks to come to the microphone because it's taped or doesn't? Uh, I can repeat the question. question okay, great. medical officers are physicians. We have a staff of 20 somewhat physicians of different specialties. So they're the medical officers. Um, they are uh, physicians who have been um, brought on through the fire department and that's what they do. Um, the infectious control officer um, is a person with some medical background who um, is the liaison between our office as well as sending out information or gathering information from the hospitals and the ME's office. And our nursing staff, um, again, we probably have 12 to 14 nurses who are um, there to do, um, give immunizations, who are there to do uh, case uh, management and help make sure that people um, are taken care of in terms of authorizations and other follow-up of tests, et cetera. There are two opportunities. Educational day is done at the, at the training academy and most companies will go through at least once a year. And at the same time, they come for annual um, so that there are two days a year that either education day and annual day where we reinforce some of those uh, programs. Do you do uh, hepatitis C testing annually or how often do you do that? Or? We do, we do annual hep C testing. And then we do it post-exposure also. Other questions? Good. OK. All right. So next, we're going to move on to Dr. Roberts' presentation. Dr. Roberts is a professor in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Services in the School of Public Health at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, she has a long-standing interest in infectious disease, and the specific area that she's going to focus on with us this morning is research that she's done with fire departments locally in um, Washington State to address exposure to methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, and this is obviously a very important topic, and we're delighted to have her here today to talk to us about research that she's actively doing. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Roberts. talk about today is really our work we've done over the last five years with a couple of different uh, fire districts looking at MRSA in um, the environment and also in firefighters. Um, Staph aureus and MRSA does not cause disease generally in healthy people unless there's broken skin or the organism actually gets into the body. Um, often, oops, sorry. Often, um, the first indication of an infection is um, a small area that looks much like a bug bite. Uh, you can inhale the organisms and cause respiratory disease, but for uh, most of the infections that we see with uh, firefighters, it's really a skin-type infection. <coughs> and um, the risk is really unclear at this point. We do know that if you carry MRSA, um, for a year, you do increase um, your chance of coming down with disease. 
and certainly if you are a carrier, um, you're more likely to have a possibility of, of infection, and in many cases, you are a carrier before you, in fact, caught, um, come down with an infection. Uh, when people began looking more recently, they found that uh, a lot of the people that died in the 1918 flu pandemic was due to secondary infections, some of which was Staph aureus. And today, secondary infections with MRSA and other respiratory pathogens are still very important after um, having influenza. And so oftentimes, people will feel better um, and then end up with a secondary bacterial infection, which actually can um, put them down and end up in the hospital. So what we did uh, for our study, which was supported by uh, Washington State Labor and Industries, is we evaluated disinfectant protocols. Um, we did bacterial cultures in two fire stations from two different districts in um, the Seattle area. And we looked at the fire apparatuses as well as in the living quarters. We sampled twice. Uh, we went ahead and sampled the first time, and then we did education, and then came back and sampled a second time. Now, the sampling that we did, um, at least based on laboratory um, examples, is that we really only detect about 10% or less of the MRSA that's actually there. So clearly, we are looking at the tip of the iceberg um, compared to what is actually out there. And then we um, were able to sample um, 40 firefighters from one of the districts and looked at what they carried and compared the organisms that they had with what we found in the fire stations. Um, when we were looking at the decontamination process, we did some laboratory studies and we used materials commonly uh, found in the medic truck and one of those were the gurney straps. And we used straps that were non-porous um, because they're easier to work with. And um, we seeded them with 10 to the 6 organisms and then um, looked at what happened over different time periods. And I think you can see, um, it's a little hard to see, but the top plate, virtually the entire surface is covered with organisms. After disinfectant, um, you only had a couple colonies, but as you go down to day four, you can see all the black colonies. And that just illustrates what happens when you disinfect a surface and then um, just do nothing. And the organisms tend to regrow um, as um, time goes by. And this was something that was of very great interest because some of the areas were not being disinfected more than a single time um, in a week's period. And it suggested to us that disinfecting needed to be done um, daily rather than um, weekly. We then went ahead and sampled both stations from two different districts. And as you can see, 50% uh, or more of the um, sites that were positive were from the medic truck and the fire trucks. And um, fewer uh, positive sites were found in the living quarters. And that was not totally unexpected. Um, the fire trucks, the medic trucks are where um, exposure with the population comes in. And so what we think was happening is the trucks um, were getting infected um, and contaminated and then coming back into the station. It was very interesting. The one station that we looked at was very old and was slated for demolition, and the other station was not, yet um, the levels of MRSA contamination was very similar. What we then went ahead and did is actually characterize the strains that we found, and one of the strains was found on a fire engine seat belt the medic truck out, um, door handle, and then the TV remote. Another um, strain was actually, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> another strain was actually found in both stations, which are 35 miles apart. We actually did find one of the organisms in the washing machine. And how we did that is we took sterile baby washcloths, put it into the washing machine with detergent, 
washed it on warm cycle, which is what a lot of the um, equipment uh, uniforms were washed at, and then cultured it, and were surprised to find um, we actually could identify it uh, from the washing machine. It was also found in the kitchen, in the bathroom, and in the other station it was found in the medic trucks, uh, in the, on their electronics, on their gurney straps, and on the bags that were brought into the um, uh, per, uh, people's houses. So this particular strain had um, the ability to, to be all over the place and survive um, a washing machine, which was sort of um, surprising to us. Um, <clears throat> before we started, one of the comments was, well, sometimes we don't always get our uh, gloves um, that have been used in um, the proper biohazard bags. And we opened up, this is a fire um, engine, and there was a dirty glove. And it turned out that the gas and the brake pedal on this engine actually was contaminated with MRSA. I'll leave it up to your imagination on how that happened. Um, and this wasn't staged, it was sort of a shock to us, but that's in fact what happened. And in fact, what we did find is that the floors in the, in the garage often were contaminated with MRSA. The floor of the medic truck was contaminated, and actually right outside where the medic truck was parked, um, the floor around the medic truck often was contaminated. And so we assume that oftentimes MRSA is coming into the living quarters on the soles of the shoes. And how to deal with that is, is something of an ongoing discussion. Here's another strain that, and this is the one that was from the foot pedal. It was also on the medic truck. It was also on the bunk, on a bunk jacket and also found on the bathroom counter. So clearly, um, some of these organisms are, are going from the garage area into the living quarters and being um, transferred around within the living quarters. And so um, what we found is that the medic trucks, the fire engines, and the fire trucks always had at least a few surfaces that were positive. When we characterized the strains, we found both community-acquired strain, such as USA 300, as well as hospital-type strains there, not surprising. Um, we found that the same strains could be found in the fire apparatuses as well as the fire <coughs> station living quarters. And we believe that what was happening is that when the fire apparatus went out on a call, they were um, servicing people that were infected or colonized with MRSA, various surfaces got contaminated, and then in fact came back, and then the fire personnel were transferring from the fire apparatuses into the living quarters and then in some cases were being transferred around. And we had one strain that was found in both fire stations um, and they were 35 miles apart. Whether this was a very common strain in the Seattle area, um, we weren't able to determine that, but it was of great interest to us. So, um, not surprising, you would assume that the medic truck and the fire apparatuses are the most likely sources of MRSA and that the MRSA was then being uh, spread from hands, shoes, bunk gear, and clothing into the fire living spaces. And then once in the fire stations, then they could be transferred and spread. And what our aim was is to try and reduce the spread of MRSA from the, the garage area into the living quarters. It's not realistic to assume that you're going to be able to eliminate the exposure of MRSA. Now, one of the things that is interesting in our study is the fact there's been one other study done on fire um, stations, and that has been in Tucson, Arizona. And in that study, they did not find any positive MRSA surfaces in the medic trucks or in the fire trucks. And we don't understand why that's the case. There's been two other studies looking at ambulances, one from Maine and one from Colorado. And between a third and a half of their ambulances were positive for MRSA. So there are some differences when you look at different parts of the country. And we don't know if um, the difference between Seattle 
and uh, Tucson has to do with the fact that Tucson's a lot hotter and drier than Seattle. We don't get to be 100 degrees more than once every five or 10 years at, at most. And we certainly have much higher humidity than what is found routinely in Tucson. But there are some differences. So depending on where you live, you may or may not have um, as much contamination in your medic truck and fire trucks as what we found. So what we did before the second sampling is we did ed some education. Um, we made a bunch of recommendations, and I think most of you have got some of the recommendations which um, I gave as a handout. We suggested that hand sanitizers be put um, on all of the doorways that go from the garage into the living spaces and signs put up reminding people to actually use the hand sanitizers. Um, we suggested that there would be increased um, disinfection of medic trucks and the fire trucks really daily, um, if at all possible. Um, certainly it would be lovely to be done after every run, but that's just not necessarily um, reasonable. We also suggested that things like keyboards be covered and that the computers be moved from the kitchens um, so that they were not there. The kitchen was one of the areas, as you might expect, that also was highly contaminated. Um, and virtually every high touch surface area, um, the coffee pot, the water um, jug, the um, dishwasher, the stove, that sort of thing, all did have um, positive um, surfaces. The other thing, as um, Dr. Kelly said, is recommending changing um, the furniture to types of materials that are easily cleanable. If you can imagine um, a weaved material is almost impossible to clean. You're not going to throw a disinfectant on a, on a chair that has uh, upholstery on it. It just doesn't work very well. And if you look at how fast liquid absorbs, it really is amazing. Um, and so if you have an, any kind of contaminated fluid on a weaved surface, it's going to get um, absorbed in very, very quickly. And so, you know, as you begin to replace your, your furniture, you should be thinking about changing to something that's easily cleanable. So then we went ahead and um, did a second sampling. And um, to some extent, we did see uh, a little bit of difference, but unfortunately, the reduction that we saw in uh, Station 2 probably was due to the fact that we had a new fire truck that was less than five months old. And so that may be why we found less MRSA in that particular air um, fire truck. We did still see quite a bit of um, MRSA. Um, and interesting, uh, one of the fire stations hadn't really understood what we were doing and hadn't done very much cleaning. But when we came back the second time, the first thing out of their mouth was, well, we really cleaned up for you, so we, we hope we, we, we look better this time, which wasn't really what we had hoped they were going to be doing. Um, so again, um, the 3.1% may be an underestimation because they actually did a, a very large cleanup job the day before we came, um, which is not what we had hoped they were going to be doing. Um, <clears throat> but. Uh, it was a very clean station after that. It, it was pretty amazing. But again, we did find um, MRSA both in the fire station living area and in the trucks. Um, and um, the levels were not that different than what we had found prior. Um, the other part of the equation besides surfaces is obviously personnel. And we were able to, to look at personnel from one of the districts. We looked at 40 people from one district. Um, they represented 13 stations, and we also did a few administrators because the firefighters wanted the administrators to be looked at, and a few floaters. Um, <clears throat> it was quite an interesting um, time. They were having an educational program at, at the one district, and so some of the people were rounding everybody up, and we were, we were doing sampling. And surprisingly, we found um, almost 23% of the, the firefighters were positive for MRSA. Now, this compares to an average community population of maybe 1% to 2%. 
and often um, many of the studies in, in um, nursing um, staff in hospitals find somewhere around 12%. And then we found 7.5% um, that ca carried uh, staph aureus. Now, if I would do a normal population, roughly 25 to 35% of um, the people in the audience would be staph aureus positive, but very few of them would be MRSA. So that was a surprise to us. What was perhaps even um, more disturbing is that um, significant numbers of the isolates, both the MRSA and the staph aureus, looked um, genetically identical to what we found in the one station. So clearly the personnel and the surfaces were um, transmitting and, and sharing the same strains. And this was uh, the case even though um, the fire district people came from 13 different stations. So there is some transfer among stations, presumably um, in our fire districts, people are assigned primarily to one station, but they do rotate. And, and the paramedics in the one district have no homes, so they rotate virtually all the time. So there are um, abilities to transfer um, MRSA and, and expose people from one station to another station. And um, prior to our study, um, one of the districts felt that one station actually, the firefighters were, were um, giving each other MRSA and there was three or four infections within a single fire station and they thought it was due to transmission within the fire station rather than picking it up um, during duty. So in summary, we looked at over a thousand environmental samples and 4.1% were MRSA and 2.4% uh, were staph aureus positive. Um, we found both community and hospital um, like MRSA strains and unlike what the dogma has been the community strains were as multi-drug resistant as the hospital strains. And in our various studies, we're starting to see that virtually all of the community strains that we're picking up from surfaces are multi-drug resistant. They, they aren't going to be tetracycline susceptible. Um, they're going to be resistant. And, and that is a trend across the country that a lot of the community acquired infections are now becoming drug resistant. 50% um, of the nasal isolates were genetically related to the environmental strains. And so transmission from the surfaces to people, from people to surfaces in the firehouses clearly is happening. Um, we think that transmission is going to always be an issue and trying to keep um, the MRSA in the garage area is really uh, a goal that we'd like to see happen. Um, again, with the Tucson study, they looked at 500 samples and they had a little bit higher level of MRSA. They didn't find any uh, fire apparatuses that were positive. They also tended to look at training centers, which is different than fire stations. Um, the main study, they found 49% of their 51 ambulances with MRSA. And then the uh, Colorado study had 47%. So there are now four studies out, um, two looking at fire stations and fire um, districts and two looking at ambulances. And all of them are showing that MRSA is prevalent in, on surfaces. This is, I hope you can see that, but this is actually a website that we've put up um, that um, you can go to. There's um, slide presentations. There's also the paper that I, uh, on the data that just was published in, in June, and we'll be adding to it. Um, I have a colleague who works on um, smoke inhalation, and that's also available. And um, hopefully uh, the top is the, is the URL if anybody has access to it, and um, we'd love to have feedback. There's also posters that are downloadable that um, Snohomish County and the people there can raise their hands because they actually produce those posters, which are really nice. You can download those as well. Um, and we're hoping to um, add to this and make it an interactive site at some point. 
what we're currently doing is setting up a year-long project to test for MRSA on surfaces within Washington State fire stations, aid cars, and fire apparatuses. And again, it's supported by uh, Washington State Labor and Industries. And we're also hoping at some point to be able to do that nationally, um, where we would send out kits and then um, they would be sent back and that would be a fee for service. Also for testing firefighter personnel. We can actually um, type the organisms so that you, we can tell you if two of your firefighters are carrying or have infections that are of the same strain. And this is what the kit's gonna look like. It's pretty, pretty easy. It's gonna have a swab in a tube and you will take it out. You will swab the surface and then you'll put the tube back, swab back into the tube, package it up and then send it to us. And um, we're hoping to field test um, the kit in, a, in a, a couple of weeks. And hopefully in a year or two, we'll have a, a better idea of what if what we found in the two fire stations in the two different districts is representative of what is going on at least in Washington State, if not across the country. And then I just wanted to uh, recognize that Washington State Safety and Health Investment Project paid for this, for this, and the nasal cultures were actually funded by Snohomish County Fire District 1. And I'll take some questions. No, we haven't. Oh, I'm sorry. They wanted to know if, if um, any fire, um, if we looked at people's homes. And there's been one study done in Boston looking at homes, and surprisingly, um, they did find MRSA. Um, we've actually done a small study looking at student homes, and we found about a third to 50% um, of the students had MRSA in their homes. But some of those were living with their families and some of them were living with, you know, unrelated roommates. So you can find MRSA on surfaces. Um, certainly if you go to people that work in hospitals, they tend to have a lot higher levels of MRSA in their homes than people that don't, at least in one study. In a second study, that was not the case. So we can find MRSA at the universities. We can find MRSAs on ATMs. People have found them on, on gym, in, you know, gyms that people go to. So you, it, MRSA is out there. All right. And, and the other question, you said that when they did nursing staff in hospitals, it was lower than the firefighters. <coughs> what about ancillary staff? Did you, did you do, like, housekeepers and stuff? Could, could it be related to education? Um, what has been found with hospitals and even dental clinics is the people that have the most contact with the patients are more likely to be positive regardless of what their role is than people that are sitting at a desk and, not, and having minimal contact. So it's really a contact issue and it, it's not related to education at all. Um, it's how, how much interaction you have with people. I think back, back there, yeah. Well, as Dr. Kelly said, you know, not, oh, re, they wanted to know um, what other I, things we can do besides PPE for protection and washing hands and, and basic hygiene. Certainly not sharing um, uh, hygiene, you know, shavers, soap, that sort of thing. We would recommend, if at all possible, if you have the ability to wash your clothes that you're using on site, don't bring them home. Um, certainly get the bunk gear cleaned on a regular basis and there certainly has been um, sort of a history of not cleaning the bunk gear. 
um, changing your clothes, and even, even your gym clothes should be washed on site. Don't bring them home. Uh, basic hygiene is really critical, and, and disinfecting and cleaning the living quarters is also important. Um, there's been some suggestion that um, besides changing the um, furniture so it's easily cleanable, we would recommend covering keyboards so that you can actually clean the keyboards. And if you look on the handout, there's a number of recommend other recommendations that we provide. Um, mostly they're common sense sorts of things. But I think being aware that um, not only MRSA but other infectious agents are something that you're going to be exposed to and washing your hands after you do a run, washing your hands before you prepare food, keeping um, the kitchen and the living quarters clean, um, making sure that bunk gear stays out of the living quarters, making sure that your uniform um, is washed on site, those sorts of things. Yes? Absolutely, you can um, decolonize people, and it's a fairly simple process. It's usually a 10-day antibiotic course just in their nose, and it doesn't hurt. Um, there is controversy about whether or not you should decolonize. Um, I'm working with um, our local sports teams, and there they've had um, a number of infections, and so they're decolonizing all the, the athletes that have turned positive. But it's, it's, you know, it's a personal preference. But um, I personally would recommend being at least monitored. And after decolonization, is there a greater risk of reinfection? Or is there oh, after decolonization, is there a greater risk of recolonization? We don't know the answer to that. We do know that exposure um, allows for more, more likelihood to be re, uh, recolonized. There are certain risk factors such as smoking. Um, if you use nasal steroids for allergies, um, that increases your risk. Some people will never be recolonized, some people will, and we don't have all the data there yet. Yes? Is it, is it um, prophylaxis? That's correct, but, but topical is different than systemic, and it, you're less likely to have a problem, and often um, the drugs we use are different for, for treating um, colonization than what you would use for therapy. Great. Oh, sorry, yes. Um, the only kinds of disinfectants we looked at were chemical, um, and in reality, they were pretty comparable. The biggest issue is, is leaving them on long enough, and um, we looked at alcohol wipes, we looked at calvicide wipes, we looked at bleach, et cetera, et cetera. Um, some of the um, disinfectants you don't want to put on electronics. Um, even with a keyboard cover, what we're recommending is alcohol because they're not gonna hurt the electronics. If you put bleach on a keyboard and it leaks, it's, that's not a good thing, um, <laughs> not at all. And certainly if you're talking about things that are, can be corroded, um, a lot of the disinfectants don't work very well. The biggest issue with the wipes is not to use them till they're totally dry because then what happens is you actually start spreading organisms rather than eliminating organisms. But uh, the variety of disinfectants are, were comparable, but you've got to make sure you've got them long enough. Most things don't work in 30 seconds. Uh, a lot of things will take two to five minutes to work if you read what they, they expect. And if you look at Lysol, it says it takes 10 to 20 minutes. So you need to look and see what you're doing, but as long as it's a dis, uh, approved disinfectant and it's used properly, that's going to be um, what you need to do be done. Yes. Along that line with the uh, washing machines, I would assume, I mean, picking people up and brush up against beds, couches, stuff in their homes, if they have MRSA, I would assume.
assume it's on our clothes a lot. Have you found it in the washing machine? Have you looked or like on the website, is there anything as far as laundry detergent that might kill it since the warm water and the soap didn't? Bleach does. And so if you, if you use 10% liquid bleach, um, it, it does a, a, a good job. And hot, and very, in the hot water cycle. Now most of us don't wash on hot, but if you do run, run the hot cycle and you do use bleach, that should do, do the job. When we went back and, and retested the washing machine after the second go around, we didn't find it. Um, so, it is. It can be there, but I. But using bleach and hot water should really keep it down. Which we can't use really use bleach on our colored. No, but you can run a uh, just a cycle with no with nothing in it. And then if your clothes have it on it, that would. Well, it's not. What we were looking at is in the machine itself, okay. not not with with clothes. We essentially put in sterile baby wipes. Um, so it was actually in the machine. Okay. Thank you. Yes. One, one last question. Did you um, take the same as far as the bedding and the mattresses? We looked at the beds and we did find a, a, a few positives there. Um, looked at the um, the mattresses, the mattress with mattress pads on them, and so certainly washing the mattress pads between people would be um, not only the sheets, but the mattress pads, or even if you're using a sleeping bag, which some people do, um, usually there's a mattress pad. And some of the stations have actually gone to uh, putting the plastic over the mattress um, to protect that. But you know, all of that material is very absorbent and it's, it's hard unless you strip it and wash it that you're gonna keep, get it clean. I think we, we were at an end, but after the session, I'm more than happy to talk, answer questions. Thank you so much. That was excellent. Um, before I introduce Captain Spar and bring up his <coughs> presentation, I just was told to make an announcement that if David Nakins is here, we have his card up front. Okay? So. Um, next. I'm delighted to welcome Captain Spar um, as our last speaker for this morning. Captain Spar is a commissioned officer in the U.S. Public Health Service, and he is the Associate Director of NIOSH's Office for Emergency Preparedness and Response. And in that capacity, he coordinates NIOSH's response to emergency events, promotes response worker safety policies, and coordinates emergency preparedness training exercises. And today he's going to talk to us about the aspect of the Ryan White Act that involves notifying emergency response employees when they have had occupational exposures. And obviously this is a key component. And the reason that we're discussing it this morning is that NIOSH is in the um, process of updating the disease list and the associated guidelines. And so this is a <coughs> Um, very relevant topic, and please welcome me. Uh, please join me in welcoming Captain Spar. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks to IAF and the EMS people for inviting uh, NIOSH to this uh, prestigious conference. We've been coming for years, and uh, we are one of the co-sponsors. And so, I'm pretty certain that almost everybody in the room is familiar with NIOSH. We are part of the Centers for Disease and Control, and, and the word centers actually has an S on it, centers. So NIOSH is one of the centers of the CDC. Uh, and in the original Ryan White Act, it was, a, it, was a, uh, it was delegated to us to develop the same sort of a disease list and the same sort of guidelines uh, that were in the original act. Uh, this is a strange act. Uh, because it's a law that actually gives uh, enforcement authority to the CDC. It's one of the few public laws where it's not an OSHA enforcement, it's a CDC enforcement. So it's a strange, unique little rule that uh, has evolved over time. So I wanted to give you an update of where we're going uh, in this and uh, let you know that uh, Congress did restore the disease reporting requirement back into the Ryan White Care Act. Uh, 
Just for a quick background, uh, Ryan White was a 13-year-old boy from Indiana who uh, became HIV positive following a blood plasma transfusion in 1984. Back in 1984, the AIDS uh, epidemic was new and very traumatic in the community. Uh, this was a, a high school student that went to school in Indiana. The, the community uh, school children and their parents became very concerned. It was a big political brouhaha. Uh, the family was so ostracized by the community, they ended up leaving Kokomo and moving to a different city to, to evade uh, the constant pressure on the family. As a result of that, they became AIDS activists. Uh, particularly after Ryan died in 1990. Uh, following his death, because this was a well-known public uh, uh, circumstance, uh, Ryan White was interviewed on TV, uh, the, the, the talk shows. Uh, he was on the cover of Time magazine. He was a very charming, personable individual. And because of that, he inspired uh, Congress to introduce a, a more robust age uh, treatment and education and uh, services program, which today we just generally refer to as the Ryan White uh, Compensation, uh, Comprehensive Age and Resource Emergency Act. Uh, but it was, it was uh, completed in 1990, and it has been reauthorized uh, ever since then for the last uh, 30 years. Today, the budget of the Ryan White programs are over uh, $2 billion. And all of the 50 states and trust territories and tribes benefit from this uh, a set of federal programs. Uh, it provides for health care, it provides for pharmaceuticals, it provides for the training of physicians and, the tr and health training of others. So it's been a very successful uh, uh, federal law. Uh, but when it was being reauthorized in 2005, uh, inadvertently during the uh, budget setting uh, process, uh, the OMB one of their tax consultants or uh, financial attorneys decided that uh, the, the disease list component had nothing to do with giving grants to the states. So they thought that, well, since this has got nothing to do with giving money to the states, why is this disease reporting law in this act? And they decided to scratch it out. So with the stroke of a pen, without much political oversight, the wine right disease reporting component was inadvertently wiped off the books. So since uh, 2006, this uh, reporting requirement has not existed. Well, that was uh, a bit of a, uh, a tragedy for EMS and firefighters. And so uh, your uh, labor groups fought back and said, let's reinstate this. And they worked very closely with uh, uh, the bipartisan components of labor uh, committees in Congress. I mentioned on the slide that uh, Ted Kennedy and Orrin Hatch were the first uh, two individuals that sponsored the bill. I do that because they're, they're a Republican and a Democrat. Uh, and then later, uh, Tom Coburn and Henry Waxman reintroduced the act. Again, a Republican and a Democrat. And I only bring this up because in our pol contentious political times, this is a great example of actual bipartisan cooperation with intent to do something good and benefit uh, workers. So uh, it's just uh, ironic that in the today's squabbling over the, over the budget and the debt ceiling that there are good examples of bipartisanship in government. As you can see, Obama signed uh, the uh, reauthorization and to his, uh, would be your right, but his left, uh, is uh, the mother of Ryan White. So she was there at the, uh, at the signing. Uh, why do we need this law? Why was the original disease reporting component there? Uh, and what benefit does it provide to you? Well, originally, uh, this law came about because uh, the existing uh, federal regulations simply didn't address um, a wide range of infectious diseases. It was a, there's only a very few uh, series of uh, biological uh, organisms that are regulated in any way by uh, the federal government or by state and municipal uh, laws. Another problem with the OSHA regulations is that uh, they don't apply to everybody. They only apply to regulated entities uh, or uh, uh, employers who have more than 12 employees. So uh, state and municipal employees, federal workers, are not covered under these OSHA uh, acts, nor are volunteers who, uh, um, you know, the fire service is made up of many volunteer firefighters. So it was, uh, it was a requirement that was timely and well-focused for the firefighting and EMS community. 
Uh, and uh, in addition to that, uh, it also has many economic benefits to you uh, by giving you a disease notification early in your post-exposure experience, you can actually reduce the cost of health care by not giving very expensive, med there's some of these medications that are, are uh, used as uh, the medication to control the, the illness, some of those are very expensive pharmaceuticals. And by being able to inform a physician that's taking care of a firefighter or an EMS worker early in their post-exposure event, they can actually reduce costs. So this law has many benefits aside from providing guidelines and standards and enforcement. It actually, it actually is uh, intended to be a, a health benefit a targeted health benefit and one that will actually reduce costs. Now, uh, bringing us up to date, uh, in 2010, although Congress passed it uh, at, the, at the late fall of 2009, uh, because the Obama administration was very involved in some of the health care legislation that it was promoting, uh, this uh, re-implementation of the Ryan White Act was delayed considerably because of all the other uh, issues that uh, the administration was undergoing at that time. Um, if you can remember back to 2009 and the, uh, all the different uh, strange events that were happening across the nation, um, this, this fell into that um, uh, t time frame of great uh, uh, political confusion and, and, and goal setting in the government because of all the crises that were striking the American uh, homeland. So, you know, HI, uh, aside from being, you know, HIV being a constant uh, threat to firefighters, we were also in the, in the grips of a pandemic for swine flu or H1N1, uh, a series of natural disasters, uh, all of those things led to a, a delay in the implementation. But finally, a Secretary Sibelius said, okay, let's get down to the Ryan White Act and let's delegate and get it, get it moving. And so it took uh, the administration quite a while to move this from Congress to the Department of Health and Human Services, and then it came down uh, to her, and she said, all right, the CDC, just as we did in the past, we're going to delegate to you the authority to come up with a new disease list. But when that delegation was given, it was a very specific delegation. It only allowed us to uh, make recommendations and make changes on three specific things. And uh, the Ryan White Act is a very long act. It has many components in it. And the only part that we were, that was delegated to the CDC was actually the creation of the list and creation of two different types of guidelines. And anything that's in that act before or after the Ryan White disease reporting component was not our domain to pontificate over or make recommendations or change definitions or expand definitions. So, the, the very specifics of the delegation really limited what the CDC was allowed to do. Uh, so be, because of that, there are, there are certain things that uh, uh, when it went through public comment, um, people were saying, well, why didn't you address this or address that? Well, it's because it was outside the scope of our delegation. We were not allowed to uh, increase the definition of what an, uh, an ERE is. Uh, an emergency response employee has a certain definition in the act. And we were not allowed to expand that to say that that does include volunteers. So it has to be implied from the old law. So there's some tricks to this because of the way it was delegated to the CDC. What we were told to do was to come up with three things. A list of uh, potentially life-threatening uh, infectious diseases, guidelines that, that describe those circumstances or the modes of transmission, and then guidelines that describe the manner in which uh, medical facilities will then provide information back to the employers. So that's all we were allowed to comment over. To do that, we put together a, 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 a multidisciplinary interagency uh, panel of, of disease experts. We had in, infectious disease experts, pulmonary health uh, disease experts, occupational health disease experts, veterinary and disease uh, experts, environmental health and safety specialists, infection control preventions, preventionists, uh, risk communication specialists, as well as legal counsel uh, came together as a blue ribbon panel and tried to expand upon the original list. And so here is the original list that came out in 1994. Uh, and there is actually the IAFF 
uh, newsletter that was talking about the Ryan White Act when that first came out back in 1994. Uh, and so uh, uh, what you see there are the original lists, and you might wonder, well, where did these original lists come from? What were the criteria for picking these diseases as being potentially life-threatening? And there are about five criteria that went into this decision logic. Obviously, they must be potentially life-threatening. Uh, they must be re routinely transmitted from human <coughs> to human, not animal to human, or human to animal, but human to human. So that, that shortens the list. Uh, they also uh, could be on this list because they were already regulated by the federal, by federal laws and regulations, or they were already uh, identified from other infectious disease lists that require mandatory reporting. And then lastly, it was uh, to be on this list that you have to be considered to be a contagious threat that poses a severe uh, threat to human health. And that's where pandemics come in. So. Uh, Taking this old <laughs> disease list, our panel of uh, uh, subject matter experts uh, came up using similar criteria, uh, another list, an expanded list. And uh, because it was a draft list, it had to go out for public comment. And so uh, uh, at the end of 2010, this, uh, we were able to, uh, once we got the delegation all the way down to NIOSH, we formed this committee. The committee acted quickly. We came up with a new disease list. Uh, we ran it to the Federal Register. And in the Federal Register, uh, there are sections of the Federal Register that are specific to different federal government agencies. And so uh, Department of Homeland Security has one part of the Federal Register. Department of Labor has another section of the Federal Register, and so forth and so forth, until you get to the HHS. And as you get to HHS, there are sections of the Federal Register that deal specifically with issues of institutes and agencies of the CDC. And so there is a special NIOSH section in the Federal Register where we post information for the public. It's called the NIOSH docket. And so uh, in the NIOSH docket, we put up a notice to the federal, uh, to, the, to the public, that we were seeking their review and comment on the proposed list of, of diseases that expanded upon the original one. Uh, that requires a process of 60 days of, of waiting, waiting for all the comments to come in. And it, and it sets up a, a, a legal procedure for us to then address those comments and adjudicate them so that they can either, they, and they provide useful insight into what additions or subtractions uh, or what omissions occurred in our creating of our disease list. So as a result of that uh, invitation for the public to comment, we received 83 public comments from 22 individuals or state organizations such as the IAFF and state health departments and uh, New York State Health Department in, in specific was one of the, one of the commenters. Uh, and all of those comments as they came in were, are, are transparent. They're still on the docket. So you can go to the Federal Register and you can look these things up. Um, as it stands right now, uh, we have adjudicated those 82 comments, and we're in the process of posting a final list. Uh, right now, as of last Friday, that final list did uh, clear the CDC Office of General Counsel, and it's now moving to the Department of uh, Health and Human Services and to the White House levels for uh, clearance. Uh, in particular, it has to go through the Office for Civil Rights and the Select Agents Program. Uh, and once that's finalized, it should, by the end of this month, go back into the Federal Register under the NIOSH docket and become the final list. Once that final list is posted in the Federal Register, then 30 days after that, it becomes law of the land. Uh, so what's new on the list? Uh, what's new on the list is an, a series of enhanced uh, uh, diseases um, that since the original uh, passage of the act have come to the forefront of public health. Uh, some of these are just uh, diseases that were, have been well known, but were just inadvertently left off the list because at the time they just weren't identified as being uh, priorities that would, should go on that list. Or new laws have come into place where new diseases have been listed uh, or under federal reg regulation or there have been changes in the communicable disease reporting laws that have, been, have updated these reporting lists, and or there have been major pandemics, which we've all survived through, uh, and 
There's also been a change in the landscape as far as terrorist activities. So taking all of these circumstances into account, we still use the same expanded list of, of criteria for picking diseases, but what we've done is we've focused down on the, those diseases which pose severe threat to human health. And so what's new in this list are new diseases that we've listed that are the direct result of pandemics. And as you can see, novel influenza A and other influenza strains with a pandemic severity index greater than three are, is now on the list. So that's a direct response to the H1N1 uh, pandemic. Also on the list is SARS, which was a, uh, in a respiratory disease before H1N1, which uh, was a very dangerous uh, outbreak around the world. So we've learned these are lessons learned. So this disease list is a list of lessons learned the hard way. Uh, also, some of the diseases on the list uh, uh, have been added because of uh, we focused on well, what kinds of diseases may also be of, uh, of interest because of the possibility of diseases which you take home from work. And so pertussis is on the list because not only is it, it deadly to adults, but it's also deadly to children. And so firefighters and EMS who may come home from the job may transmit these infections to their families. And so we took into consideration that as well. Uh, and then the, the most significant change, I think, uh, uh, is the select agents, which is the last one on the list there. Uh, these, are, these were selected because of, a, unfortunately, a growing sophistication in terrorist activities targeted uh, against uh, political organizations to score uh, political points. Uh, and so we, we looked at this a lot and we gave it a lot of deep thought. Uh, and so we, what we have done is we have, we have adopted the entire select agent list onto this list. And so you may not be familiar with uh, you know, either the pandemic severity index level or what, uh, what can be a, identified as a bioterrorism uh, agent. So on this list is just some, some links to places where you can find additional, more detailed information about uh, the pandemic severity index. But basically, the pandemic severity index is a way to scale uh, the severity of, a, of a, uh, a pandemic that's occurring around the world. Uh, it's a scale of, I believe, one to six. And if you're above a level of three, then that means there's a significant number of people being uh, infected and that it's, it's passed beyond the borders of at least five countries. And so it's a significant pandemic event. Uh, but there are different definitions of that. You can look those up if you are so inclined. Bioterrorism agents, uh, this is the entire list that uh, is on the CDC's list for select agents. And not all of these are in themselves particularly dangerous to firefighters or EMS employees. But we adopted the entire list because of changing circumstances. Uh, as new terrorist uh, threats evolve, they will automatically go onto this list. And so by adopting this select agent list in its entirety, we ensure that it be, there will be an automatic adoption of any new threats that come up in the near future. Now, obviously, Rift Valley fever is not really a big threat in the United States. But some of these agents are, are, are serious uh, disease threats uh, and do result in human-to-human -human transmission, primarily because some of these agents are, are intentionally modified uh, artificially to increase their uh, transmissibility uh, and or their lethality. In, otherwise, in other words, they're weaponized. You can weaponize anthrax to make it more lethal. And that's what, you know, the, 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 the letter threats to uh, the Senate and the post office system, uh, all of that was about, they were concerned about weaponized anthrax because that was a specially prepared uh, spore that was fiddled with by man to make it more uh, transmittable and more uh, easy to take in the lung and make, would make it more deadly if it was dis distributed in a, in a wider uh, situation. Uh, also, some of these uh, select agents uh, can be intentionally concentrated and deployed in quantities far greater than would be found in nature. 
So because of those two conditions, they can be weaponized or they can be concentrated and deployed, uh, we decided to add select agents to the list. Uh, and so it also expands the definition of what exposure means. So if we were to take the modes of transmission and we, if we were to combine both the old list and the new list, this is what you would get. And it's, I just tried to, to colorize it so you could see in your mind's eye where, are the, uh, where the old disease list was. And none of those diseases were removed from the list. All the old diseases are still there. And then we just added more contemporary high-risk pathogens to the list. Essentially, uh, uh, diseases transmitted by contact in body fluids, by aerosolized airborne means, or by aerosolized droplet means are unintentional infections, whereas those that are transmitted by biowarfare agents are intentional infections. So we had to expand this disease list and, and categorize it, so we're adding a new alternative route of transmission. So the biowarfare agents then become a atypical pathway of transmission. So we are expanding upon the traditional infection control modes of transmission definitions that you're, more, you're used to being uh, trained about. So that was part one of our delegation, was to come up with a new expanded list, put it out for public comment, um, adjudicate it, standardize it, make sure that everybody was happy with it, and then move on to part two and part three of our delegation. Part two was uh, a set of guidelines that would describe the circumstances. And basically, this was just to bring up to date the modes of transmission. So what we're doing here is we're adding uh, the biowarfare component to that set of definitions, along with the other, you know, direct contact, indirect contact, airborne, droplet, uh, ones that you're used to hearing about. Okay, and then the part three is uh, we're refining uh, the ways that uh, a healthcare organization can report back to the fire department or the EMS worker uh, the status of uh, a suspected exposure, and basically. Part three of the guidelines talks about four ways that the hospital, let's say in this case a hospital, can report back to a fire department. They can either report back that the exposure did occur, that the exposure did not occur, uh, that the facility does not possess enough information to make a determination, or that the facts submitted are insufficient to make a determination. So under the rules of the Ryan White Act, if you, if you as a firefighter say, I think I was exposed, and you go to your infection control safety officer in your unit, and you say, I think I was exposed on this date, under these circumstances, can you find out? You can then go to the healthcare facility where these medical records might be. The hospital then must respond within 48 hours to, to make a determination. And under the HIPAA laws, they are, they are not allowed to report personal information, but it's not a violation of the HIPAA laws to report that an exposure occurred where it did not occur and when it occurred. So that's what you get back from the hospital. What you get back is the name of the disease and the date of the suspected transmission. You get no information about either the victim or the firefighter uh, that were in those circumstances. So the Ryan White Disease Reporting Act is not a violation of HIPAA in any way. So what's gonna happen next? Well, I predict that uh, your infection control training materials will be updated. Uh, that includes both the FEMA and the NFPA standards that you're all used to referring to. And one of the ways that uh, after this information is posted to the Federal Register, uh, I believe that uh, we're gonna roll out our new topic page on the CDC information website. Uh, we have one already pre-prepared to go out, and we use every means of public communication that's popular today. We can blog, we can tweet, and uh, uh, we have our own hot topic page just on the Ryan White disease list reporting uh, material. Uh, and that's it. That's an overview of the update, what's happening, and what's going to happen next. Any questions?
Thank you all so much for attending. We're right at 10 o'clock, so the speakers will be up here for a few minutes. If you have additional questions, thanks and enjoy the rest of your day.